So, uh, all right, so let's try to, like, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I want to highlight a few steps here. So the first one is going from good sketches to weekend bendings. Um, so here is an almost shortcut. So I'll tell you something that does not quite work, but you know, just to highlight what the problem is about. So one option is to try to use basically a theorem that we showed with Robbie Krogamer uh, a while ago. And basically what it, it showed is that if you have good sketches, let's say of size S, then what you can get is uh, one bit, you can reduce that sketch to really one bit, and success probability is something like just slightly bounded away from half, so something like half plus two minus s, okay? Uh, so basically this means, I mean just to reinterpret what it means, it means that sketch, remember so that sketch, one bit sketch is basically just some function mapping into bits now, into like just one bit, it is randomized. So basically, so we have a randomized uh, function into zero one, such that if the distance is small, uh, then you have basically probability you know, I, I would also have to tell you that this is what the referee does. You know, trust me that this is what's happening. Uh, but basically, this result means that the expected uh, distance, you know, basically the expected distance between uh, between the embeddings of uh, of closed things. Sorry, it should be the other way around. Should be at least. Uh, sorry, this should be uh, real time talks. Uh, Sorry, is, is the opposite. Um, okay, so if you're if you're close, then <laughs> sorry, it was bad. I got confused, oh, sorry, too early in the morning. Um, okay, if the distance was small, then the distance is small after this, and if the distance was large, then the distance is, is large as well. This looks almost like this one. Um, uh, why? Because we can take F, which basically maps into, let's say, uh, real, uh, you know, infinite dimensional uh, cube uh, between zero and one, um, basically by enumerating all randomness, right? So each new coordinate will correspond to a random string, okay? And you scale each coordinate to the corresponding probability. Uh, so basically you get an F such that this expectation is transformed into actual distance, okay? So this almost gets this, except for these two quantities, basically. In particular, you know, here we want a, something like a gap of 10. Here we have a gap which is a very small, is, is a factor very close to one, okay? So this, I mean, this reduction almost works, except that here we really need some constant gap. Just because the rest of the proof uses some triangle inequalities and you really need something like factor three at least, okay? So, so this doesn't quite work. And this is why, basically, this is intuitively why we are using this uh, direct sum theorem uh, from the paper with Jerem and, and Mihai Petrashko. Um, okay, so here is, the actual, uh, here is the actual proof. So what we do is, in some sense, you boost up a little bit the, this um, norm x, uh, and you go to L infinity. And basically, the actual statement is the following. If there exists a, a S-bit sketch for the norm x uh, with approximation d, then you can get also order S-bits for L infinity of dimension k, with approximation which drops with k, okay? So, and you use it for some constant k, um, okay? And the proof idea is that, you know, suppose these are the two inputs to LS and Bob, what you do is you sketch the distance between uh, these Radiomacher sum. So you take sigma i's, which are random plus minus one, and you sum up both x's and y's with the same random signs, you get two vectors in, a, in the norm x, and you sketch that, and you use this, this, this good sketch, the assumed sketch, okay? And the interesting part is that you can prove that, say, with half probability, this, uh, the new norm, like with this Radimacher sum, is uh, up to factor k approximation to the original norm, to the, to the max, to the L infinity of x norm. Okay, so this is, this is this reduction, basically. Um, 
and uh, and basically, so once once you get this, you know, k uh, k fold of this norm x, then informally, what this theorem, uh, this direct sum uh, proves, is that if this admits small sketch, then uh, then norm x admits even smaller sketch, something like by a factor k smaller. Okay, so in a sense, this is what allows us to, you know, make this uh, additive term of two to minus n to be larger. Okay, so in a sense, we are we are folding up kind of x into kind of k-dimensional fold, uh, saying that the sketch size should be roughly the same. But now, using this theorem, we are saying that that actually x has to have much smaller uh, much smaller sketch as well. Note that this increases the approximation. So we're basically, you know, using these two steps, we are trading off the approximation of the sketch size to drive it really down. Okay, this is all I'll say about this. Um, uh, so the next step is to go like from uh, weak embedding to this uniform embedding. Again, weak embedding is basically one scale embedding and this uniform embedding is this kind of poor man kind of uh, embedding but for all scales. Um, and uh, okay, I'll just you know flash some ideas. Um, I, I don't really expect you to follow too much about it, but just you know to show you what kind of ideas go into that. So what you do is so the problem is you know you have to handle all scales here somehow. Okay, so how do you do this? Um, so note that you know this does not even guarantee that this function is injective. It could be that some points x and y, which are very different and have some non-zero distance between them, are mapped to the same point. If there used to be a distance, let's say 0 0.1, then they can be mapped into, into the same point. And uh, basically, this, you, you cannot find any lower bound function then. OK? So you need, you know, you need to modify this embedding, uh, this purple embedding f. Uh, so here is, here is how you do it. So you take n, which is a one net of x. So basically, uh, you know, potentially infinite set of points, uh, which is one net. Basically, our distance at least one from each other, and, and everything else is within distance one from some net point. Um, so you, you prove that f is basically Lipschitz on this net point. So if you consider just if you forget everything else and you just remember the function f on these net points, these embeddings only on these on these holes in, in the in the metric, then it is Lipschitz. Basically, the distances are not distorted, and then you use what is called an extension theorem. Basically, it says suppose I have a function and it is defined on on these particular points on these net points, and it is Lipschitz on these points. Then I can extend it to the entire space. Okay, to the entire uh, to the whole x, uh, such that it still coincides with the original function of the net point, but it is Lipschitz with res uh, in the rest. Okay, so basically what we are saying is that there might be some local imperfections. So because of that, you kind of remember some global picture in a sense, and then you do some extension extension theorem, which is some kind of smoothing uh, of this function f. Okay. And you know there are more ideas that go into this, um, but basically the type of you know just to show you kind of how these functions L and U look like. Um, well, the upper bound is something like root of the distance, and the lower bound is this. Is, is this? I mean, so it it is linear up to up to reaching one, and then it stays uh, constant at one. Okay. So this is this is the kind of embedding that we get. Okay, and now you use basically, you know, just to put the full picture. Now you use this theorem of, you know, Aharoni, Mori, and Mityagin, who says that, you know, once you have some some functions u and l here that satisfy these conditions, you can, you know, you, you can basically transform it into an actual embedding into uh, LP. Okay. And right. if you didn't quite get it, like it's it's not your fault. Um, okay, so uh, let me kind of you know finalize this part um, uh, with some discussion. So 
so he, you know, so far basically the statement, you know, the theorem that, uh, that we've seen said, so suppose you have good sketches with efficient sketches, which means a constant sketching, constant sketch size, constant approximation, then we can embed the same norm into some L1 minus epsilon. Okay, so this L1 minus epsilon looks a little bit weird. I mean, it's very normal to say, like, can we actually embed into L1? Because L1 is like a standard norm, and, you know, it's normal to prove non embeddability statements there. Okay, so, so it would be nice to strengthen the theorem to saying that, well, uh, to say that if there are efficient sketches, then you can embed into L1. So it turns out that this problem is quite non trivial because, you know, with our theorem, it basically is equivalent to an open problem in functional analysis. Uh, it's called Quakian's problem. Um, and uh, it, it basically, this open problem is really that. You're saying, like, suppose you can embed something into L1 minus epsilon, can you also embed into L1? So this is not known. Is that, is that for any epsilon greater than zero, you can embed in L1? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the distortion drops with epsilon, right? It's it's divided by one uh, divided by epsilon. So the closer you get to a one, the the worse the approximation. Okay. So another uh, another interesting direction, but this this star, especially in the second talk, will will show kind of what I think are interesting open questions. Um, so. Uh, Another, another question is, can we extend it? So this theorem holds for norms only, and there are a few places in the proof that uses uh, the fact that it is a norm. So the question is, can we extend this to metrics? I mean, there is, so as far as I know, there is no uh, counterexample to the statement, to exactly the same statement as before, that sketches, you know, efficient sketches implies embeddability into L1 minus epsilon for any metric, okay? So the only one thing that we, the only one counterexample that we know is that if you want this kind of statement, basically stronger, stronger statements in both the metric and embedding into L1, that we know is false. Right? Because, uh, you know, there has been a lot of beautiful work on Heisenberg group that, you know, some metric that embeds into the square of L2, it's negative type metric, basically, which means that it is efficiently sketchable, but it does not embed into L1. Okay, so the Heisenberg group is a counterexample uh, for you know, general, for the more general statement. Um, and of course, you know, natural question is, you know, can you, what happens for larger approximations S and D? So, so far, this theorem is really kind of targeting constant uh, uh, S and D. Um, and another, uh, and yet another question is to try to prove similar kind of statement for linear sketches. So, you know, so far we kind of thought really about kind of these decision versions where we really took sketches as being bits, uh, but we can think about sketches as linear sketches where your sketch is just projections like in compressed sensing, for example. Um, so now we talk not about number of bits, but number of measurements and so forth. So, you know, are there similar statements for linear, measure, for linear sketches? Okay, so this finishes the first hour. <laughs> Um, and let me switch to the second hour. Um, and um, okay, so so that was that was it about uh, in, uh, equivalence of sketching and embedding. Uh, and now we'll kind of go more towards kind of sketching for nearest neighbor search. Uh, are there questions, comments? No. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so again, so repeating something that, you know, from an hour ago, we said that, well, if we, we say, you know, we've seen a simple theorem saying that if you get a sketch of size S uh, and some approximation D, uh, then this implies that we can design a nearest neighbor search which has space n to order S and one probe. Okay, so really preprocess the query and just do one lookup in your table. Okay, so by amplifying error to one over N. Um, so basically, um, you know, we'll try to be a little bit more specific or a little bit more careful about the, the type of sketching that we design just because, uh, you know, this is not always the, the best space that we want. I mean, can we, can, if we want to design kind of better solutions with, which 
have better bounds on space, we'll be a little bit more careful about how do we define sketches. And basically, you can think about sketches as, you know, having these two parameters, kind of completeness and soundness. Basically, we want to separate the probability, uh, the probability of false positives and false negatives rather than just success probability in general. So in general, you can think about the sketches having a completeness uh, parameter P1, which is basically the probability that we answer close when the points are close. Um, and soundness, you know, just, just like in proofs, exactly. And soundness, P2 is the probability that we answer close when the, when the points are actually far. Right? So this is basically the probability of false, false positives. Okay. Um, right? So, you know, in general, we can think about sketches having three parameters now. So for given approximation D, we can think about, you know, previously we just talked about sketch size. Now we'll actually look more attentively at the probabilities P1 and P2, basically completeness and soundness. Okay? And in general, you can ask the question, you know, what are the best trade-offs between these uh, completeness, soundness, and sketch size? Okay? So this is... You know, this is not exactly what I want to talk about, but, uh, but in some sense, you know, some of the things that I'll mention later will touch upon this, uh, upon this question. Okay? So, so far, you know, to use, basically, to be usable here for nearest neighbor search, what kind of sketches did we, did we design? We designed these sketches, basically, by amplifying a simple sketch of size S. Um, to have better probability. And we designed, so for L1 and L2, we said that, you know, by repeating log n times this basic sketch, which has size one over epsilon squared bits, we got something which has size one over epsilon squared log n, and it has basically completeness one minus one over n and soundness one over n, okay? And uh, basically, at least the sketch size is optimal um, for uh, basically this space is actually optimal. Okay, so you cannot, you cannot really hope to get uh, better space parameters uh, with, let's say, with this completeness and soundness. Um, but, so, I mean, this, this means that your space is something like n to power one over epsilon squared. And, you know, the natural question is, you know, can we get smaller space? Okay, so, uh, so basically, the way to get smaller space is basically to look, you know, uh, at what we'll call for the purposes of this talk as low completeness sketches, which are essentially LSH, locally sensitive hashing. Just to just to give you a different perspective on LSH. So, so another way to design sketches or kind of you know when we get can get better parameters is basically to say well. Uh, you know, as we designed so far, the sketch size is relatively large. It's something like log n divided by epsilon squared. We'd like it to be much closer to log n, which will give us space much closer to linear. So what we'll, we'll decrease s by decreasing this, the completeness as well, by decreasing p1 as well, okay? So, uh, so you know, the general so, uh, theorem, and this is due to Indic Matwani, uh, if we, if we get a sketch, let's say, that has size S, let's say it has soundness one over N, again, probability of false positive is one over N, but now we allow P1 to be much smaller than, let's say, a constant, uh, then we can get a nearest neighbor search solution which has space which is two to power S divided by one over P1, and the number of probes, probes and basically the query runtime is one over P1 as well. Why is that? Well, you think about, you know, um, the proof, it's exactly the same as like this full indexing scheme that we, you know, designed previously, except that we repeat it one over P1 times. So if we just do exactly the same indexing, basically we prepare for all possible sketches, right? Then there is only a probability P1 that we actually uh, certify that we have found the close point. So if there is a closed point, there's probability only P1 of actually finding it. So we'll need to repeat this entire experiment one over P1 times. Okay, so this is, you know, exactly the same scheme as before, kind of just pre-indexing all possible sketches, except that e this time, uh, the probability of finding the closed po point is only P1, so we have to repeat it one over P1 times. Okay, does this make sense? 
Okay. So, and basically, you know, what this is is really basically local sensitive hashing. Okay, so basically like low completeness sketches. Okay, so um, it's, it's not quite, I mean, like there is, you know, one more additional kind of fact, uh, fact about LSH that basically the Charlie's algorithm really checks the equality for the sketches. Okay, so it is not, the Charlie's algorithm is not a generic algorithm that does whatever it wants with the sketches, it really checks the equality of the sketches. That's, you know, the algorithm. Uh, but it is not that important, actually. So for, for the, from the algorithmic perspective, the fact that Charlie does that, it is, not, it is not important for algorithms, except that it has this nice property which allows us to, you know, talk only about, not about three parameters, but about two parameters. So in particular, you can think that, you know, if your, Charlie, if your algorithm is basically just checking equality, you can think about as P2 being roughly equal to 2 to minus S. Okay, this is basically without loss of generality. You can think about two as being uh, inversely exponentially in, in the sketch size. And uh, why is this the case? Well, assume that your sketch size is much larger. Then what you can do is you basically can hash down, basically take a random function from your sketch of, of much, larger, much larger length into sketch uh, of which has only log of one over P2 bits. The LG stands for logarithm base two from now on, okay? And um, basically since, since the actual algorithm just checks, checks equality, this only completeness remains the same. Uh, probability that close points are equal, you know, can only go up. Uh, so the problem is with soundness and indeed the soundness can increase a little bit, but it increases by another uh, P2. This is the probability that two random strings of length x, s are equal, you know, which, and since as we set s to be something like log of one over p2, this increases the soundness by another uh, term of p2. Mm -hmm. So, so soundness, by definition, it says that consider x and y which are far, right? What is the probability that uh, Charlie says close, condition that x and y are far? Right? This, is, this is soundness, right? Yeah. Um, right, so what we're saying is that, right, so we're saying like if you restrict your algorithms here, then you can basically reduce your sketch size to something like log one over P2, okay? So for example, for, uh, for nearest neighbor search, remember that we set soundness to be one over N. This is the probability that we say close for a far point. Since there are N of these far points, we want this soundness to be one over N. So this means that we can really think about sketches being just log N, right? Which means that the total space, which was two to power the sketch size, now log n divided by p1, basically this means the total space is order n divided by p1, okay? Um, so, I mean, this is, I mean, basically just like reformulating LSH. Now, um, and you know, how do you usually, so in some sense you can drop the other parameter sketch size. You can always think about this as being logarithm over one over soundness. And the, usually, the usual way you kind of, you know, now you can ask the question is what is the best trade-offs between these parameters? What kind of sketches can you uh, design? And basically, you know, here is how you usually think about the sketches. Um, you know, how do you define these trade-offs? So suppose you have a base sketch which has probabilities in completeness and soundness which is Q1 and Q2. So what you can usually do is you can do concatenation of a few sketches. Okay, so basically you take k copies of the sketch, take an and between these, so you know, each of the sketch checks for equality, you say, well, now we want that k copies of the sketch are all equal, and basically this means that all of these probabilities go down as an exponential in k. Right, so if q1 was the probability that we, uh, we collide, um, 
and you know, under, under assumption that the points are close or K2 is the probability that they collide under the assumption that they are far, you know, if we take K copies of these then, and require that all of them collide, this means that all these probabilities go down as a factor of K. So basically, you know, just doing some, you know, easy algebra, um, in particular setting the soundness to be one over N, so we, we need to set K such that the soundness becomes one over N, assuming any Q2 beforehand. This means that P1 will be Q1 to the power K, and you know, figuring out what K needs to be here, uh, you get that P1 is equal to one over N to the power rho, where rho is this function of the original Q1 and Q2. Okay, so what is the conclusion of this is that we really kind of want to understand what is the trade-off between P1 and P2. And the way you usually think about this trade-off is that you'll set the soundness to be one over N, and then the completeness will be something like one over, one over N to power rho, where rho is some, is some parameter of the, it's the quality of your sketch. Okay? And in some sense, kind of this, this trade-off between the probabilities is really kind of determined by this rho. Right, and if you want to design kind of better sketches, you need to improve this row. Okay, so again, so for LSH, basically for any n, you can get a sketch which has, this should be log n actually, a uh, sketch of length log n, a soundness which is one over n, and let's say uh, this, the completeness being P1 where you think of P1 as being n to minus rho. Then uh, basically, you know, for Hamming space, what you get is this parameter rho can be upper bounded by one over, this is the original index Matwani, this is, this is what they showed. Um, this also holds for Euclidean space. Uh, we actually showed that, you know, joint work with Piotr Inding a long time ago, showed that actually for Euclidean space you can get better trade-offs between these probabilities. You can get better uh, uh, trade-offs between this completeness and soundness. So basically this exponent is just one over d squared as opposed to one over d. Um, these are just examples of these rows for a fixed approximation, which is two. And uh, at least for LSH, uh, you can prove also lower bounds matching these, uh, matching these upper bounds. So this is due Mat uh, uh, to Matwani, Naur, and Panigrahi, and the tight bounds were shown by O'Donnell, Vu, and Zhou. Okay? So, <clears throat> just a, a final comment like, regarding this uh, low completeness regime is that these bounds, in part most importantly this one, uh, the, wall, the wall are actually in the limit as n goes to infinity. And in some sense, this seems to be necessary, as in you really need to drive down these probabilities to be small to get these trade-offs, basically, to get this kind of trade-off. In a sense, if, if you choose your, uh, f for small uh, ants, which is, you know, equivalent to saying for, uh, sorry, uh, for large P2s, if you want the probabilities P1 and P2 to be relatively large, you, you, uh, there is a lower bound saying that you need higher, uh, higher parameters. Wrong. Okay, so, okay, anyways. Uh, so if, if you tuned out, you know, from LSH, you know, you can tune in uh, back now. Um, so basically, you know, just kind of post-discussion of these completeness sketches is that, you know, you, you can use the sketches differently uh, to design your neighbor search. Uh, all these long completeness sketches, where you think about them as being parameterized like that, uh, are done via LSH, but it doesn't have to be. Right, so basically when we say like, well, when we design these optimal low completeness sketches, um, the best ones that we know are via uh, local assistive hashing, it means that the referee checks the equality. It doesn't have to be this way. We can still design alg algorithms. So I, I don't know if this is the best achievable, if basically LSH is the only way to do, or you know, the best way to do low completeness sketches. Okay, so let me kind of um, talk about, you know, the last topic of, uh, of this tutorial. Um, how, much, how much time do I have?
Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so, so let us, uh, so, so we will look now at a generalized version of, of sketching problem, uh, basically certain kind of n fold of the problem. Okay, so here is a definition. So here is a definition of sketching, you know, from an hour and a half ago. Uh, so we said we have Alice and Bob, you know, we, we send these short sketches to Charlie, and the Charlie kind of looks at the sketches and decides on the output, okay? But, you know, the way we're using it for, say, nearest neighbor search is that we said, like, well, you know, basically Bob had a bunch of these vectors, and, um, you know, when we uh, kind of in the data structure, uh, you can, you, what you really wanted to do is you wanted to compare sketch of x with sketch of each of these y's. Okay, you'd amplify the sketch to have very low uh, probability of false positives, and then you'd apply basically Charlie's algorithm to, to sketch of x and sketch of each of these y's. Okay, so in a sense this is, you know, if this is the problem that we want to solve, then, you know, perhaps you should define it directly, and, you know, maybe we can, uh, we can do something differently, maybe we can do better. So in particular, you know, the, the actual problem that we need to solve here is the following, that Alice has a, string, uh, a vector x, Bob has vectors y1 up to yn, and uh, Bob basically, well, you know, Alice and Bob have to output with, say, two-thirds pro success probability, close if there exists some point yi, which is a distance at most r from x, and it says far if all the points are more than distance with approximation times the threshold. Okay, this is kind of the real problem that we need to solve, but we're, in some sense, previously we're solving a little bit indirectly here with kind of the simplified sketch, but maybe we can solve this problem more efficiently. Okay, and, uh, you know, what is the communication pattern? Like, well, we can think about Alice sending, basically, a sketch or a communication message to Bob. Okay? So this is, you know, solutions here again, by this full indexing, uh, or maybe even, again, this low completeness kind of regime, will give algorithms for nearest neighbor search as well. Uh, yes? Uh, Sorry? Right, right, yeah, we, we, we'll get that there a little bit, yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, great question, I mean, next slide, actually. Uh, so, can we do better? And uh, it is not clear, actually, right? If, if, if we change this problem, you know, can we do better than what we used to, have, uh, to do using this kind of simpler sketching version? It's not clear. So, for example, you know, a norm to consider uh, is L infinity, just, just as a, like an extreme example. So, the sketching complexity of L infinity is something like D, the dimension divided by approximation squared. Right, so even if your approximation, let's say, is polylogarithmic, then the sketch size is pretty much linear in the dimension. So this means that, let's say, if your dimension is something, let's say, log squared n or something of the sort, then this sketching complexity is too large. Even, you know, even never mind how many vectors there are, even for one vector. Right, there is, it's not clear that we can do something better here. Right, why, I mean, why sketch size, uh, which is linear in D bad, is, well, again, as before, if we are using an indexing scheme, then we are solving the nearest neighbor search of space, which is two to the power s, and this becomes something like, you know, two to log squared n, which is, you know, super polynomial. Not good. Okay? So, um, references for lower bounds. Uh, and I should mention that, you know, this question looks a little bit like a direct sum question, except that Alice, instead of having n inputs, it just have one input, uh, but Bob has many inputs. Okay, and you have to apply, in a sense, this basic problem of uh, distance checking, or like this distance, distance threshold problem, for x and each of these vectors, uh, y1 up to yn, and you basically apply an OR function at the end. Okay, so it, it's a type of direct sum question. Okay, so, so it's not clear that we can do better, um, but, uh, you know, going back to Sudipto's question, 
it turns out that if you are a little bit adaptive, then you can do much better. Okay, so what does adaptivity here would mean? Let's say, well, if you allow Bob to communicate some information back, so it is a two-way communication protocol, then you suddenly can do much better. Okay, so how much communication should we allow Bob to, to communicate? Um, well, we will, uh, I mean, we will think about Bob. So Bob has something like an input of size at least n. So we'll say, let's allow Bob to communicate back uh, something like sub-polynomial number of bits. So it is allowed to communicate back n to small of one bits. Right? This is far less than this entire database uh, set of points. And uh, yes, question? Mm, it, well, you it doesn't matter as much, no. Yeah. So, I mean, so I'll show an algorithm, this will be relatively clear why the algorithm. So basically, again, you can design, if you get your uh, S to be the communication from Alice to Bob, you can still design a data structure which has two to the power S space. Think about this as basically this, uh, writing out a binary tree of the communication uh, profile. Okay, and each time kind of Bob communicates something back, this means just reading out in memory something, that's all. Okay, so basically, while this is not written in the slides, again, if, you know, even if we, if we do this, the claim is that you can still do Something like uh, you can get space which is uh, two to the power s, maybe n to small of one. So again, you know, minimizing s would be important, uh, and the query time becomes something like uh, n to small of one. Okay, if if we manage to solve this communication problem. Okay, so now the question is, can we do better? You know, since I'm talking about this, the answer is yes. And you know, the, the main question is, why should this be possible? You know, for example, many direct sum questions were saying that, well, this is usually, you know, unless you communicate a lot about the database, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be possible to solve the problem much better. Right, the Bob, Bob cannot communicate too much information about every, any particular Y, including the one which is about near neighbor. Um, okay, so yeah, let me call this data dependent sketching, just because it's kind of sketching, but it depends on the database actually. Okay, so why is there an advantage for Bob to communicate even a few bits back? Okay, so so I mean, let us kind of take a look at you know how do you prove a sketching lower bound? So usual kind of you know simultaneous protocol for just when Bob has just one one y one vector, okay? So you know the type you design you know the way you do this lower bound you say like well you you have a distribution on the close pairs and on far pairs and let's call this x and y um, so yeah, green and red for close and far and uh, um, and then basically say for L infinity, how would these distributions look like? Um, okay, so you design, design, uh, define these two distributions and then you prove that, you know, unless you communicate blah number of bits, you cannot distinguish these two distributions. Okay, good. So for L infinity, how does this look like? Well, it looks like, you know, something we're following. So your distribution on the closed pairs will generate maybe x random from some distribution and y, y will be basically this uh, vector x and you maybe do plus minus once on each coordinates. You know, think about the threshold r as being one from now on. Okay, so these points, this x and y will be always a distance at most one in L infinity distance. Okay. And now the far distribution, you know, will try to be very similar to the closed distribution except for one difference to make the, the pair far. In particular, it will also choose x random. Y will take uh, x with, you know, in each coordinate you add plus minus one. Uh, and maybe you choose like one hidden coordinate and you, you add a much bigger uh, term here. So you'll add d 
uh, thereby kind of forcing the, the distance in the uh, four points chosen from Fivar distribution to be big D, okay? And you have to be a little bit careful how to define this for infinity, but you know, that's pretty much the intuition, okay? So, so, this is, so this is the distribution when we have just two points, when Bob has just one Y. And why doesn't, I mean, why doesn't this go into, into this two-way communication uh, scenario? Well, you know, let's try to kind of generalize this distribution or let's try to port this distribution from two points to the case when Bob has n points, okay? So how do we do this? So, I mean, the general principle is that this far distribution, in the far distribution, the x and y are correlated. Okay, so this means that the way to generate a natural hard distribution is to say we choose the query point, the x, which is this blue point, we generate from the closed distribution one close point, and then we generate n points which are kind of far away, right, from this distribution, condition on x. Okay, so now the fact is that Bob, it, you know, sees the data set only, I mean, without the colors, of course, uh, but the fact is that uh, since y's chosen from the far distribution are all correlated with the query, you can see the structure in the data set. So Bob can actually take a look at the data set and infer something about uh, the original query point. In particular, what it can do if, you know, if this is really kind of the distributions we were uh, using to generate the data set, then you can take z, which will, uh, a vector z, which in each coordinate it will just take the median of all the coordinates that it sees there, okay? So, uh, so each coordinate of z, so this vector z will be within distance one of the query point. Okay, so then you can see, I mean, since, since this z is close to the query point and this y, this green point is close to the query point, you can pretty much find immediately which is the query point without even talking to Alice at all. Okay, so basically the conclusion, I mean, the idea being that the way you prove the sketching lower bounds when you just, Bob has just one vector is that for far distributions, X and Y have to be correlated, okay? So if you generalize to this basically n fold problem, you are not, I mean, having uh, many points correlated with the query is bad because then you can see structure. So, you know, the general principle, the intuition is that, you know, your hard distribution should be such that, you know, for this n fold problem should be such that this Y, one up to Y n should be all, uh, uncorrelated with your query point except for the potentially the close point. Okay, so the question in some sense becomes proving a lower bound for sketching complexity when your far distribution, when you design this mu far, the x and y should be uh, independent. Okay, and you know, the question is, okay, can you, know, can you actually get better bounds? So let's suppose you have L infinity, Suppose you, uh, you really kind of force yourself that this mu far on the pairs of points be such that it is a product distribution, that x and y are independent. What is the highest lower bound that you can prove? Right, this is kind of how the question becomes now. Okay, and, uh, and basically let me show you kind of what happens for infinity. So this is this data dependent sketch for infinity. It is due to uh, Piotr Rinding from 98. And basically what I will, show you in, I guess, five minutes, is uh, an analysis which is due to joint work with Doran Kreator and Mihai Patrashko. Um, it's a little bit different than the original paper. So, so I'll show you, I mean, in a sense, I'll show you an al algorithm, actually. It will be a decision tree, okay? And from the decision tree, one can extract the protocol back, actually. Uh, and the decision tree will look a little bit similar to a KD tree. Will, uh, on a data set, so big Y will just denote these endpoints that Bob has. Um, so let's say these are the, the point set. So the algorithm will basically look like KD3, um, just, just decision tree, geometric decision tree. It will somehow take this point set, will partition them using what we call coordinate cuts, basically. It will take just look at one coordinate 
of the input vector x compared to some number and say if it is smaller than, you know, depending on the value of this comparison, either go left or right, um, and then recurs. So on the, let's say on the left hand side, you, you know, do another coordinate cut, you partition again, and so forth. Okay, so you recurs in each part until basically you've partitioned all the points and each of these parts has just one point in it. Okay, uh, the main question is of course, you know, how to design these uh, coordinate cuts and we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, but before that, let me uh, say what, are this, what is the actual statement, what one can prove. So what one can prove is that for fixed rho being bigger than one, let's say rho is 1.1, so it turns out that you can get approximation which is doubly logarithmic in dimension, okay? With, uh, uh, with, which a tree, with a tree which has size n to power rho and depth is something like d log n, okay? And using standard reduction in communication complexity, this algorithm, this decision tree with these parameters basically implies that for the same approximation, this doubly logarithmic approximation, uh, you can design a protocol where Alice communicates rho times log n bits, and Bob communicates only basically d polylog bits. Back. Okay, definitely subpolynomial in it. Okay, so how much time do I have actually? At least five minutes, okay. Okay, 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 cool. Um, are, are there questions about that? So basically, you know, even if Bob communicates very little, very few bits, something like d log n bits, we can suddenly improve the trade-offs between the approximation and the sketch size. Okay, okay. So uh, let me kind of give a glimpse of how this algorithm works in the next five minutes. So here is how the setup uh, is. And basically, I mean, this coordinate, it's all the question of choosing these coordinate cuts. It's, I mean, how to choose them is a little bit kind of mysterious and like to try to make it a little bit less mysterious how we choose these coordinate cuts. I'll show you the analysis and the algorithm at, at the same time. And basically the, how you choose the coordinate cuts will come out of the analysis, in fact. So, um, <clears throat> so let me define a few quantities and these are kind of information quantities. Um, so let's say we have a vertex V, let's say this one. We'll define the following quantity. We'll define Q of V to be the set of queries of points that are reaching the node V, right? So this is a tree. Let's say, you know, vertex V corresponds to this less half. So basically all this space is called Q of V. Now, uh, let me define um, basically the neighborhood of this Q of V is basically, you know, all this space enlarged by one in all directions. Basically this is, this bigger shaded box is basically all the potential neighbors of the points, uh, of the points in Q. Right, so it's just Minkowski sum with L infinity ball of radius one. It's a formal statement. And now we define YV to be the set of candidate nearest neighbors in this, uh, in this expanded, basically in this neighborhood of Q of V. Right, so basically this shaded box is what are all potential nearest neighbors for this smaller box. Okay, and Y of V is basically intersection of this bigger box with the actual data set. Okay, so whenever we get to this, with a query we get to this node V, then Y of V are the potential answers that we still have left. This is how we should think about it. Okay, so we'll assume a query distribution, a distribution mu on queries. So this is just a purely analysis gimmick and we'll define this mu a little bit later, in fact, uh, as a function of the algorithm, but it is just easier to think about this as the queries coming from some distribution mu, okay? And what we'll define is basically this, in a sense, empirical information uh, that a node V has about a query. In particular, this is log of one over measure of the set of the potential queries, okay? So this, in some sense, measures the information that we have revealed about the Q so far. Okay, and we'd like to upper bound this quantity. 
So the less information we reveal about Q, the better. It's like the, the smaller information Alice has to send to Bob. And indeed, basically, we can prove a bound on the decision tree size just because the number of leaves is bounded uh, uh, yeah, the number of leaves is bounded by the maximum of this two to, uh, to the information, uh, just because the sum over all vertices of two to minus, over all leaves V of two to minus information quantity is equal to one by definition. Right? So if you choose query from a distribution mu, it has to reach some leaf. So this means that this sum is equal to one, and this, and this implies that the number of leaves is upper bounded by the maximum over all leaves of 2 to this information quantity. Put differently, we just want to bound the, up, we want to prove an upper bound on this information quantity. So this is quantity one. Quantity two is, is to define uh, H, of, uh, H of V, basically. And this is basically the log of the, of the candidate set. Right, so this is the entropy that is remaining in the identity of the nearest neighbor. Okay, and we want to we want to drive this entropy down to zero because this means that there is no more entropy left in the in the identity of the nearest neighbor. Okay. Okay. So this is just a repeat of the definitions. So, you know, as you can, so we'll design some decision tree. We can take a path in the decision tree, right? And we can trace these quantities. And you know, as we go down, the identity of the nearest neighbor goes down. And the identity of this, uh, sorry, the information revealed about the query will be creeping up. Okay. So what we want to prove, and you know, we can measure, we can measure, we can define derivatives of these functions, which basically we, we are uh, determine um, discrete derivatives. Uh, basically, there are progress that you make on this information from a node to its child. So let's say consider a child like the right child here. Then you can define kind of local delta, basically the local derivative, uh, to say that, well, by how much did the information about the query increased? Okay, so this is increasing, so this is why we take this difference. And delta, and this is the derivative of the, of the entropy of the nearest neighbor, and they're saying, but how much did the entropy of the nearest neighbor decrease? Okay, so these are just, Think about this as discrete derivatives. And the goal, like basically what we want with these dimension cuts, is we want to find dimension cuts where the derivative, the first derivative is upper bounded by rho times the second derivative. Okay? And if we manage to always find this dimension cut, um, then this means that, you know, since this goes down from log n to zero, this means that this information about the query will go up from zero to at most rho log n. And this immediately implies that the size of a decision tree will be n to power rho. Okay. So, so this is the goal. Uh, now you, I mean, since I'm pretty much out of time, you'll have to believe me that there are such dimension cuts. So, um, yeah, this is, okay, sorry for flashing the slides. Um, but basically you can write out exactly what, what this means, this inequality means, what this, what this goal implies uh, as a function of the probabilities. Somewhere along the way, you'll start defining how the mu distribution on the queries looks like. Question? Let me just. Uh... One is the difference in terms of the capital Z, and one is the one you created. Sorry? The, the delta Q is the one right. you created? Yes, precisely, yeah. So when you're building this separation tree, you don't know the queries. Yeah, we don't know the queries. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, we will define the measure mu as we go along in the tree. So, so if the, maybe this will help. The final algorithm is deterministic. There is no randomness in it, actually. This is, this is just uh, analysis giving, basically, kind of. So we'll, we'll define, so you know, the way the, kind of the algorithm works, or the analysis works, is that you define pi to be some empirical distribution. So you, you reach some vertex. You have some points in the data set. You, you consider some coordinate C 
whether it, we want to find some dimension cut. So we say like, let's try dimension C uh, and find their dimension cut. And the dimension cut means that, you know, we take some value i and we're saying like, oh, to the left or to the right of this i, right? So you, you fix a coordinate C, you, you can define pi to be the empirical distribution of the data set projected on this coordinate. And then you say like, well, let's try i to be a separator. Okay, so then you can write this uh, derivative on the, on the entropy of a neighborhood as a function of this distribution pi. Uh, and then you, you will define this mu, where you will put a condition on the distribution on the queries uh, to be a function of this pi. Okay, just because, and just because we kind of go down each kind of successive node in the tree is the refinement of what we had before, these conditions on mu will not be contradictory. So we'll just refine mu and more and more. But it is not necessarily unique distribution mu. Okay? And basically, you know, once you define this mu as a function of pi, you can write everything as a function of pi, and at the end of the day, you'll get a statement of the following sort, that, you know, the distribution pi has to satisfy this condition for it to be a good cut, to satisfy this goal. Okay, so again, the goal is to find a dimension cut, which means this, and you know, doing some calculation, this will imply some condition on the distribution pi. And now you're saying like, well, what if we don't find any good separator in any coordinate, right? This induces some condition on this distribution pi, okay? And you know, at the end of the day, you'll see that this distribution pi decays doubly exponentially in i. Right? This is just comes out of that goal. And, uh, you know, basically then you say like, well, if you go out kind of log log these steps, this means that the distribution pi dropped so little that it is less than something like one over d squared for all coordinate c's. This means that there will be a large fraction of a point, something like half of the points, that will be inside a ball which has uh, side length, something like log log d. Okay? So anyways, uh, this will mean that, you know, you can put a special node, something like is x close to the center of this box, and if it is, if it is close, this means yes. You know, there is half of the data set there, and this is where the approximation comes from, actually. Okay? Anyways, um, so let me just wrap up. Mm, so this is, you know, this is what I promised. This is what we kind of got. Um, so can we do better? The answer is no. This is, I mean, basically this, this kind of analysis also suggests a hard distribution. Uh, and one can prove that basically, even if Bob communicates something like n to 0 0.9 bits, then Alice still needs something, uh, something like omega rho log n. So there is some kind of sharp threshold happening that Bob needs to communicate a few bits and this already allows Alice to drop its communication by a lot. But it does not add, uh, you know, but if Bob increases his communication much more, it still does not improve Alice's communication. You know, perhaps until Bob reaches very close to n, in which case, you know, the problem becomes trivial. Okay. Um, so there are, you know, you can ask whether you can improve, uh, kind of use this data dependent hashing to improve uh, for L1 and L2. So for this case, there is some partial progress by Thijs Warhoven. Um, there is much more work that, I mean, we actually did in the low completeness regime. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I should finish, right? Um, basically, just to show you 4L1. So basically, in kind of sequence of work with Petr Indyk, Huyn Guyen, and Lea Rosenstein, in a later paper with Lea Rosenstein, we showed that for, say, for Hamming space, in this low completeness regime, Using this data dependent sketching, you can get better traders between the soundness and completeness, something like going from, you know, for approximation two from exponent a half to exponent a third. Uh, later, we showed uh, with Willa Rosenstein and another uh, paper with Willa Rosenstein and Eric Weingarten, uh, we showed that this is actually optimal. Um, again, kind of, even if Bob communicates much more bits, you still, um, you know, this is the best trade off. And there is a similar case for L2. Let me just conclude. Um, so, you know, so I talked about sketching uh, and its connection to embeddings. So, 
from my perspective, kind of, you know, this, this sketching notion seems very related to kind of, you know, some questions in coding theory. In fact, there is a little bit better connection uh, that is suggested by Ilya Polanski, uh, who studies something called alpha beta codes. I, mean, I can tell you what they are uh, once we're in the break. Um, and just like in coding theory, we really care about the constants, uh, you know, what is the rate. Uh, the argument is that we should, we should care in exactly the same way for sketches as well. Because, especially because the sketch sizes for us goes into space for, say, for nearest neighbor search, and this becomes a constant in the exponent. Um, and basically, you know, I talked about standard sketching where we have sketch of X and sketch of Y is being sent to Charlie, who is the referee. Um, like basically, the theorem that we sh uh, we've seen is that you know, constant sketching, constant approximation is equivalent to embedding into uh, LPs. There is a need for more refined theory. I mean, so far, you know, it's, it's very basic, uh, um, very basic parameters, basically. You know, it's talking about constant sketch, constant distortion. Um, and also we talked about generalized sketch, where you know, this later problem where we have sketch of X, which is sent to Bob, who has this database now, of points, and it turns out that you can get much better bounds if Bob can communicate a few bits back to Alice. Uh, and I mean, I don't know, a, a question that I really like kind of, and I think like is, is really nice, is you know, this suggests kind of, especially for, you know, for L infinity, we also have some progress on L1 and L2. Uh, can we do the same for other norms or other distances? Right, so for all the norms and distances where we have sketching lower bounds, perhaps in this generalized sketching setting where Bob can communicate a few bits back, perhaps we can get much better bounds. For example, you know, things to consider are like F over distance matrix norms for which I you know, mentioned sketching lower bounds in the first, in the first uh, part of the tutorial. And for example, a question that you know, I really have no idea what is the answer is that, is it true that for any norm we can achieve log log the approximation like we did for L infinity? or other norms which are in some sense harder. And I'll end here, thank you.